I kind of, I'm hinge hitting for Sarah Corbett, which for me is a huge honor. Um, I'll pinch hit for her anytime. Um, I know you've been, I know you've been out on the road a lot. Is, is everybody hearing okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I know you've been out on the road a lot, so I'm a little bit worried that every question I'm going to ask you is one that you have already answered um, approximately. But not for you all, hopefully. <laughs> and then I can always answer new questions. Okay, good, yeah. good. So, um, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit, just that mention of your three years in Beijing um, at the beginning, in the introduction. I am... I'm really curious, because you wrote this memoir, where, and, and how many people out there have read Foremost Good Fortune? Oh, yay, that's so exciting. Um, because you wrote that memoir, I think sometimes people feel like, I am done with that subject. Um, but did you always have it in the back of your mind that you might revisit China in fiction at some point? Yeah. Um, so, I had unfinished business with China, it turned out. I um, had this novel sort of in my frontal lobe for about eight years after I left China. Um, in my memoir, um, for those of you who've read it, it wasn't supposed to be about cancer. It was supposed to be about um, American family goes to China. And I, I was kind of obsessed with Anne Lamott's operating instructions. And I, I had boys, and I wanted to sort of take that to Beijing and do this kind of, um, it was supposed to be comedic, actually. <laughs> and then cancer came, and then I didn't think I'd finish that book, but then I did finish that book, and it turned into this other thing. But I had been to this um, yoga retreat, we'll call it a yoga retreat. It was a yoga retreat, but it was just the most rustic, um, sort of elemental experience on the top of a forgotten mountain, two hours north of Beijing. You know, nothing, nothing fancy. There wasn't really anything. There's very little fancy about Beijing in 2007 when I was living there. And this was like, there really was intermittent electricity. And, it, you know, we were really were doing yoga on a dirt floor. And um, we had the day of silence. And we were walking on the donkey path in the pitch black. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to write a novel about this. <laughs> I want to write a novel about this. And then I kept holding it. Um, and then I tried it in third person because I didn't want to write another memoir about China, right? Even if I gave the conceit of first person, I was, was I writing the same book? Um, so I was really in the end playing with fiction and, and truth and fiction and truth. And the thing that's even more um, confusing about this novel is it's, it's written in the conceit of a memoir. So it's tricking, it's trying to play with the reader the whole time. Yeah, and of course, I, I, then my character becomes alcoholic. She has a lot of struggles, and I thought, oh, well, here we go. I'm setting myself up. This is my second, everyone's going to think it's my second memoir. Or that you drink a lot. Or yeah. that I drink a lot. Yeah. 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 I just feel like she does, I, I've never really seen her drink a lot, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not autobiographical. Well, I mean, we write about things we're, we're interested in um, emotionally. All right, I will say I do. I would say that my greatest impetus for writing is emotional curiosity. It's not plot. <laughs> um, so I'm very curious about diseases that constellate around families, around people, and I know about this disease. So when she, when Elsie got this disease, she also had, was, she's also sick with just another sort of more manageable pro health problem. I was trying to pile things up on this woman. I was trying to really put pressure on this woman and see how she'd react. Um, and I wanted to see if she could be strong and powerful in the end. Um, but I couldn't believe she was gonna have an alcohol problem because that was gonna be hard for me to write about and sort of um, share with the world because I knew so much about it. Um, but I felt like I had to be really emotionally honest um, and if there's anything I hope for this book is that it, it feels emotionally honest because Elsie decides to be bracingly honest, I think. And we get to know her, and, and she, she gives us a little bit more throughout the novel, too, so that she kind of... How many people have read this book? Oh, a lot of you. Okay, great. Um, you know, after I finished reading it, I wrote to you to say, 
how much I loved it and how I felt like it was this leap for you. And, and, and I wonder, it, it's very, very sparse, especially, you know, compared to Paris is the place, um, was the place. Uh, and, and I wondered whether or not you're a poet and whether in this book you felt that the, the pull of poetry more than you had in the past, that you felt in freer to explore that sort of sparseness that I, that I do see in your, I mean, I'm thinking even just in terms of um, the book that you did with Winky Lewis, Stop Here is the Place. Is Winky here? Yay! Um, I'm thinking about those beautiful, beautiful little miniatures that you wrote for that book. And mm -hmm. I felt that voice very strongly here. I mean, not as Susan, mm -hmm. but it felt different to me tonally. That book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So when, when that happens, when you slip into that different voice, did, did you, were you feeling very conscious that you were pairing things down? I mean, did you feel like I'm getting to a new place here? Um, very conscious, very intentional about voice. Voice is everything. Voice, voice is just everything. You know, to me, I think, and to most good literature, um, you, you have so little time to hook the reader. Very, very little time to hook the reader. So that voice has to sort of sing and electrify on a sentence level. Um, and I think that it wasn't so much that it felt like a leap, it felt actually more like a coming back to more of this poetry. I mean, I, my whole life was sort of poetry, actually, for, for like 15 years. Um, and I also was, I'm gonna say, tired of a certain conventionality that I would, had been like steeped in, that I'm gonna say was really masculine and really patriarchal and I was really looking for her to claim like some power and some space and sort of say things in a more unconventional way. So there's, there's something going on around her claiming her, her strength too. She's not gonna say it. I, I myself, and I don't know, I wanna talk about this, I'm so curious what you guys think later, but I feel like really daunted now when I'm handed like a 400 page book. <laughs> um, I feel like it's got to be an attention span problem. <laughs> Yet, I'm very compelled by the shorter form. So the miniatures in Stop Here, This is, Was the Play, uh, no, yeah, Stop Here, This is the Place. Um, it's funny, I remember, um, if you, we could do a little game. Like there's, there are um, little lines of Stop Here, This is the Place that are airlifted right into this book. So I had found the voice, particularly for the children, in Stop Here, This is the Place. Really? And I took them and I dropped them right into this book. Like beg, borrow, and steal, right? When you're writing. I always say that. You take, you cold, hold your material, you never know where it's gonna go. So, um, in fact, like verbatim, there's a verbatim section. And I thought, well, anyone, is this a problem? Is this a problem? <laughs> um, and I remember too. No, but, um, no, I think the wolf section. It's the wolves. The wolves, yeah, the wolves. There's a the, one of the girls in here says, "I'd like to go." Basically, what would happen if I left you and go went and lived with wolves? And the mother says, Elsie says, "I really don't want you to leave, but if you go, go try it, and you can come back to the family." And um, a, a real life character said that in um, "Stop Here, This Is the Place." So. Um, a totally different gendered character, different age, you know, so borrowing from real life, taking emotional truth and moving it into fiction. And I will say for me, having it feel just as emotionally true, just as emotionally resonant. So this notion of genre sort of bending and genre fluidity is very close to my heart. And I think in America, we get really tied up with, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Have you written a memoir? What have you written? And in Europe, we're writing stories. You know, we're just writing stories. So um, I'm all about storytelling now. <laughs> I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about the influence of the patriarchy on your style beforehand. Because are you talking about Paris was the place? I mean, 
I just think that there's been this wonderful explosion of autobiographical women's fiction. I will call it autofiction, if you will. I hate that phrase, autofiction. But there are some women out there that are doing such innovative, exciting things that are blending memoir and fiction. And, um, you know, I, I want to be on that team. <laughs> like Rachel Koss. Yeah, like Rachel Koss and Sheila Hetty and, um, gosh, um, I could go on and on. But, yeah. And, well, even so, Heidi Jewell, that's uh, technically the folded clock is memoir, but it also has sort of a auto-fiction feeling to it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is a lot of that. Jenny Offal, Department of yes. Speculation. That's Love a beautiful that book, book, I want to so say. Great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, so not necessarily the style of narrative in your previous books. Did, did you feel that those were conventional? Or did you feel that... Probably, yeah. Well, I think the voice... No, I mean, I was... I, you just, you, you, you evolve, don't you? So for me, writing a cancer memoir didn't feel conventional in, the, in a way because it had to be so, so honest. Um, I think that um, Willie in my, um, in my novel, Paris Was the Place, is actually, she, she's fairly innovative actually. Um, but she isn't as honest as Elsie is. You know, there's some people that, um, we've talked a lot of in, in my conversations around around the um, around the, the country around this book around is Elsie claiming her strength, and um, I've had a lot of people say that she's like allowing herself to be kind of coerced by marriage and coerced by these sort of um, conventions, but she's actually always strong underneath them, inside them. Um, in fact, I have a friend. I think, I think he might be here now, but um, his mom read the book and I was at a reading with her and she kind of stood up in the Q&A and said, every man should read this book. <laughs> um, and she thought that Elsie was always strong and was kind of just playing along with her husband. <laughs> That's a great blur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because Lucas kind of says, oh, go off to the yoga retreat. You'll get better. It'll be fine. Just, if you could just go off to the yoga retreat, it'll fix all your problems. And she knows she, Elsie knows she needs to do something, um, but I think she knows it's not, that's not going to be the easy fix. Yeah, and I think the reader kind of knows that too, probably. Right, that she's got some work at the she's end of the novel, not to spoil it for yeah. anyone. But yeah. um, so the um, the the artist that she is, that Elsie is, reminded me very much of a main artist. Um, and I wonder whether or not I have the feeling that you probably know her, and Elise Ansel, and I don't even know if I'm saying her name right, but that style, Elsie has this, uh, just it's such an alluring description of her work that she's given up, um, or all but given up, really. And, um, and I kept thinking of, okay, these great big canvases that speak to um, the great masters, but in this abstracted way. And I wonder whether or not, you know, just living here in Portland, whether you soaked in some of that <laughs> Elise inspiration. <laughs> um, she is a friend of mine, um, for sure. And we have had some conversations about um, that, that um, sort of debunking the, the, the great master works. Um, in particular, we had one good conversation around this, this, this you know, I wrote this, the, the, the famous rape paintings, right? Like, you can, they're, they're so iconic, right? Lita and the Swan. And, and um, they, that was where I really wanted Elsie to go. I wanted her to start realizing, like, why are, what, what is with all these rape paintings on all these museum walls? And can I, can I refashion them? Can I debunk them? And then it took me to, I think, freshman year of college English. And I remember, like, we were handed Yates and we were reading. I mean, when I think back on how we read Lita and the Swan so straight like so literally, like there was no problem with that poem. Yeah, like the rape is history. Yeah, like the girl is raped and it's very beautiful and then a <laughs> swan goes off into the sky. And let's, yeah. So I really wanted Elsie to revisit that. Um, it's, it's quiet though, we don't, I don't talk about that very much. No, very few people actually pick up on that. 
you know, Elsie's had a lot of problems, so that's just a small one. <laughs> You know, I, I guess it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about, you know, about her problems. It, it, I mean, I would never say, oh, this is a novel about a head case. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's more a, a novel about someone who is in a, a period of their life that um, is not necessarily, that, that won't necessarily define her for the rest of her life. I mean, it's sort of, I feel she's in transition, and we're there with her. I, I like that, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I don't feel like if you did a sequel in 10 years, she'd be living on the streets. No. You know? No. Um, <laughs> no. I'm really curious about what she would be doing. Um, you must have started this, though, before the world exploded in the Me Too movement and the, you know, the whole, the whole sort of, I don't, I mean, for me personally in the last few years, I've been like, you know, I really do not give a flying whatever. That's why I'm here today with getting those with a run. Um, but, but because of the length of time it takes to write a novel, I'm assuming that you were not writing this in, a, you didn't start this in a fit of rage in 2016. No. Um, emotional curiosity. So I wanted to know more about that woman on that mountain, Elsie. I wanted to, uh, she was on the mountain, it was dark, she had a day of silence, and I wanted to know more about her. Um, and I wanted to know always about all the women who were parenting in my orbit when I was bringing up my kids because I kept, I wanted to be like, are you, do you have this figured out? Are you doing this okay? I don't think I'm doing this okay. How are you doing? And I felt like it was a secret. Nobody was tell, talking about how much they were struggling. I wanted to have a sign that read like catatonically sleep deprived and just wear it. And I thought it was really self-indulgent and I didn't, and so nobody was complaining. Like nobody was ever saying and everybody was like sinking and sinking. And I think I, I just decided it was going to be political in the sense that Elsie had to compromise, and Lucas, her husband, did not. And Elsie was obsessed with her children and obsessed with her work, and could she do both? And she found it hard, and that was like my, my, my rhetorical question for the book, right? She was gonna have to find it really hard because fiction equals conflict, right? Fiction equals tension. So her conflict was gonna be her compromise. Um, and so I, at first I thought it was going to be a triptych. We were going to have three women, British, Swedish, the British, Chinese, American, and each one was going to get their time. Each one was going to speak in, third, in first person. And that was terrible. <laughs> and even my agent was like, I just think maybe not, maybe not. And I was like, okay then, I'll show you. And I went back and I was like, what does this woman Elsie really have to say? She has some things to say. And she started talking, and I tell you, the novel was really fast after that. She, it, I wrote it very quickly because Elsie was talking. And she was just talking, and I, and I thought, okay, you're going to say some things. Here we, here we go. You're going to say things that are going to make me uncomfortable, and you're going to make my larger family uncomfortable. <laughs> and... Um, you may make some women feel uncomfortable, and you're going to say them. So here we go. And then that was that. Huh. Yeah. Okay. I have two questions that relate to that. Um, so you wrote it really quickly. You know, you have you have two teenage boys now. One of whom was, is going off to college in the fall, um, and you uh, have a very active life with the Telling Room, which you co-founded. Um, I'm always curious about how writers do it, and I wonder. In that writing fast, did you go away? Did you did you lock yourself up in a cabin somewhere? Did you go down to the West Point? Mm -hmm. What did you What did you do? So I, you know, I teach a lot, and I tell people to be my students, and some of whom are here. I won't look at them right now, but I say um, you have to be incredibly stubborn about your writing time, about your creative time. And when I get into the what I call the high high pitch mode. I get really stubborn and disciplined. Um, and so then I'm up in the attic, and I'm, I can be like 
I can be like 5.30 to 7 a.m. and then I can be like 8 to 3. I can be like that. And that's a lot of time, right? Because my kids go to school. Um, that takes like, like a muscle that I have to, 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 to strengthen over weeks to get back up into that kind of form. I've actually been there the last two or three weeks because I just delivered another novel that I sold in October, which is um, a novel all about teenage boys. <laughs> hmm. And there, it's completely set in Maine, and it's kind of like so exciting and so close to my heart because I haven't really fully written about Maine yet. Um, so I can tell you that it means like, Saturday and Sunday, it's quiet in my house to like 11 because I have teenage boys and they sleep a lot. And so you can get a lot of writing done between like six and noon. <laughs> um, I go, I do go away. You know, I said this week, but I, I've been on the road a lot for this book. So I've been missing my family a lot. So I didn't, I couldn't go away. Couldn't go away for this new delivery. So I pretended I, I kind of announced, like, I'm going to be, things are going to look, you know, I'm going to go up there more. <laughs> and then um, I said to my husband last week, I said this, I should be away right now. I should be, because once you go away, and this, this is exactly what Elsie talks about when she talks about the recklessness that she needs to paint. It's for all women and men who need to do whatever the hell they're doing, whatever project they're doing. I think it calls for a certain recklessness that the conventional world does not allow you. The, the, when, the time, when the clocks are working on time, we are not able to, to, to go off the grid. And so um, I always have to go off the grid. And so it's, it's really hard to go off the grid and make lunch or make dinner, as we all know. So allowing ourselves, and I, again, I won't look at my students, <laughs> allowing ourselves to say, no, I'm gonna be in a different world now. I'm, I'm finishing a book or I'm finishing a painting. Elsie was trying to finish you know, paintings and she likes to do that at 2 a.m. and that really doesn't work um, for, for, particularly when you have small children. Um, so yeah, I'll stop now. I just went on a long time about process. No, that's, that's great. I have to say that I, I often think about you um, when I am making the decision that breakfast is going to be cereal. Because I remember once you told me, um, you know, I just said to them, you know, fend for yourself, there's cereal. And, and I, that, that felt miraculous to me. And it's very hard for me to let that go because I'm like, you know, a nice hot breakfast would be so beneficial to you in your day, honey. <laughs> Um, even though I know that actually he probably enjoys cereal just as much, but um, but so that's that's good that you're able to do that. And how on earth did you turn a novel that you sold in October in already? I mean, it's it's. But I sold it as a draft. I did. I sold it as a draft because books take a long time to to be birthed, right? So this thing was in production most of last year. I have, I've lost complete track of time. I have no idea when this book came out, January. So it was in production. So that means hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. So you get a draft, you do an edit, and then you wait. And all that time, I, it was very, very, very helpful to be writing another novel or doing something creative, not waiting, because that's kind of painful. So, um, and I, I want to say that there, a friend of mine who's not here, but I'll, I'll name him because I think he would like to know that. He, he doesn't know this. Oh, I think maybe he knows this, but Seth Rigoletti really liked Stop Here, This is the Place. He really liked it. He's a dad. And he said, hey, are you going to do something with those boys in that book? Because those stories you wrote about those boys, those little miniature stories, those are amazing. And I, I want you to write a book about them. And I remember thinking like, wow that's really working for you, because it's really cool, it's particularly a man sort of t And I, there's something to that, something to what you said, because you need permission when you're starting a new project, and um, he gave me permission in a way. I mean, it wasn't just him, I was already cooking it, but I loved hearing that those boys were resonating to that man, and those are the boys, those boys become teenagers in the new book. Wow, so is it sort of, is it more Stand By Me, Stephen King, or is it more Essie Hinton, The Outsiders? I mean, oh. Or is it neither? It's more like Fleetwood Mac, 1970s, 
mom has some kids, <laughs> some boys. Oh, and she's sort of stuck on an island, and she's she's um, married to a fisherman who gets very injured. And this is all of the Maine that I grew up in. So it's ten right now. It's tentatively called landslide. That's so great. I, I don't know if you all saw the essay Susan wrote for Decor Magazine. Not for Maine Women Magazine. <laughs> I guess somebody got to her first, but there's a lot of Steve with Mac uh, references in that. It's yeah. an excellent piece. I highly recommend it. Yeah, for anyone yeah. who grew up in Maine or is interested in people who grew up in Maine. Yeah, that was coming right out of the novel. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come back to your uh, your uh, your sign, catatonically sleep deprived. When you were in that stage, <clears throat> did you ask your mother? How she maintained her sanity. I mean, she had uh, she had three kids, um, pretty close together in age, right? And um, and I wonder how much of a rock she was for you, or how comfortable you felt saying to her, "I I, I feel like I can't do this." You know, did did that ever? Did that come? Oh yeah, yeah. You ask for help wherever you can, right? You, you I definitely asked for help. I definitely did. She she's an extremely involved grandmother. She's here in Maine, but um, you know you're alone a lot. If you're, you know, my husband worked. He was traveling a lot. Um, I also don't think I was writing any poetry then because poetry called on a different part of my brain. That's actually when I started writing my first novel was when I had young kids because I realized it was something you could come and go from the longer narrative and that these shorter miniatures and things were much harder, actually, because you had to be, you had to distillate and const, uh, crystallize your feelings in a way that the sleep deprivation wouldn't, wouldn't allow. Um, so that's almost like the reading process. I mean, that, that a short story is you know, perfect for the limited attention span, but the novel is the thing that makes you want to go to bed early so that you can pick it up, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that um, I'm, I've been interested to learn that a lot of women felt like they weren't asking for enough help. And that a lot of women have resonated with this book because they too were making a lot of compromises and they weren't talking about it. And so that's been very interesting um, to take on the road and listen to. And then I've been very interested in a lot of women coming forward around this book who um, haven't had children yet, and they're thinking about having children. And um, I didn't realize that they, they're like, these are women that are deeply invested in their careers. And then they are seeing all of these stories as cautionary tales. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been really interesting for me. All of a sudden, I feel really old. But it's, I mean, do you, do you feel that it's a cautionary tale in any way? I mean, for me, I feel like I got way more done and I'm much more directed. I mean, not so much now that I go to hockey all weekend long. <laughs> but back in the day, I felt like, okay, you were you have finite time. Get on it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes such an issue of class and, and privilege and, and daycare. And it's really complicated, right, for women to find their time, their space. <clears throat> yeah, it's really complicated. It is. Um, I, so I know some of your students are here, and, and, but I'm really curious about what the process of teaching has done for you as a writer, um, how it might have shifted you and your own work. I mean, you're constantly in this role of examining someone else's effort in a level that I think is probably a little bit different from your writing group. You're in a writing group, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I wonder how just how it feeds your own process. That's a really good question, because it talks. It, it reminds us all of, um, for any of us who are trying creative projects is how important it is to read voraciously, right? And just voraciously and widely. And when I'm in my teaching mode, and I teach at the grad program at Stone Coast, um, where I've been for I think seven years now. And I also do a lot of private book editing, um, and I do lead workshops. I think it's so much a question of pace. 
And I, and I think that's also why I'm writing shorter compressed stories now, because um, I am so interested in a kind of urgency on the page. And um, that's what I'm always like sifting through with my student work, is like, I want them to really, really own and, and carve out their voice, and then realize how little time we have to hook the reader, sadly. <laughs> But we never have had, had very much time to hook the reader. As Marianne Moore, the great poet, said, nobody wants to read your story anyway. Get in and get out as fast as you can. You know, and I've really taken that to heart. You know, Marianne Moore, grandmother to Emily Dickinson, let's keep it short, let's get in and let's get out. Um, you know, that doesn't mean, like, I just read Ondaji's Warlight and I loved that book. I love that longer, meditative, sort of sensual, poetic inquiry. I loved that. But you want to be in really good hands, I think, when you're going to settle in for that. Yeah? Um, this is a, sort of a fangirl question, but how did you get Judy Bloom as a, as a blurb? I mean, <laughs> that, 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 that had to have been, I remember seeing it on your website yeah. or something and just being like, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, so what happens in this world, this sort of, trolling world where you're looking for people to say nice things about your work is your editor sends your book out to a vast array of people right and it's like go, they go fishing and they don't know where they're going to get a bite and you know as my dear editor who i'm now doing my fourth book with um she sent a lot of books to judy bloom and she's never gotten a bite <laughs> and judy bloom um was my hero. I, I, I really grew up on Judy Bloom. I think many of us did. But she, I mean, I was living in Woolwich, Maine, and I was just devouring, right? And all through the, you know, she, she and I grew up together like many of us. So that by the time we got to forever, we were hiding it under a mattress. And we really were hiding it under a mattress and passing it around. And, um, I, so something, it pleases me greatly still that something in this book spoke to Judy Bloom and she just really responded to the book. And then the next thing we know, she was inviting me to stay with her. She did not. She did. She invited me to stay with her in Key West and be her, the, I was down there as their January book club person. And she, in the end, she couldn't be there because her husband was having cancer treatment. I think he's going to be okay. But she wrote the most beautiful letter that was read before I read at the store, and then I did stay. I stayed in her home. I took, I took like, fan photos. <laughs> I did. And, of course, she had my book, like, prominently displayed on the coffee table. But imagine, you guys, I was alone. I was alone in her home. So I don't really know how to describe that, except that it was on the ocean, and the waves were crashing. And it, it was very, very surreal. I think I may have to write an essay about it. And then I will clear it with her. But it was like being, being in there alone. Like her assistant let me in and showed me where the wine was and the water. And it was the most, it was like being in a museum. It was gorgeous. An enormous sort of apartment on the beach. And then everyone left and I was alone. I was alone. What was in her uh, refrigerator <laughs> <laughs> and freezer? Like, did she have a lot of ice cream? She had a lot of um, she had a lot of snacks. She did a lot of snacks. Um, she hadn't been there for a little while. She had um, what did she have? She, I had I did I like raided the fridge. I was starving. She I had cheese and crackers. Uh, yeah, it was it was really very magical and wild. Yeah. Um, is forever your favorite, or are you there? No. Yeah. Favorite? Probably that one. Yeah. Probably that one. Dini. Remember Dini. Dini. It's like the, like the book that made you think scoliosis, not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I could handle that if I were Dini. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I think what was so pleasing about Judy Bloom's apartment and her first of all, she has the most incredible store in Key West. So to see this woman that. We may have put over here in kind of YA, highly, highly literary woman with the incredible library, reads so deeply and has first editions of everything and just, and so beloved in the literary community. And then to go to the store and see this thing that she, she's the engine behind and how beloved she is there and just how alive she is because she's, she's in her 90s now, I think. Yeah. 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 
inspiring to me. Yeah. So was there any other writer who particularly inspired you in this book? I, you know, it's funny because when I first picked it up, I thought, oh, I think Susan's publisher is going for kind of a, um, where'd you go, Bernadette Market, with this cover, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And also the title. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but was there anything, was there anything that you've that you read in the last 10 years that you thought, yeah, I, I want to do something kind of in that hmm. vein. Okay, so that's a good question. You're, you, you, it's it's nice the way Mary comes at it more from like the market and sees it like the the, the book critic from time, right? So the title fell in my lap, and I won't. I, I, there are people that haven't read the book, but the title is embedded in the book, and it came organically. There's a moment, and the title it was given to me um, when that happened. I have another title. I'm big on working titles that take me like the next 100 yards down the path, and then I ditch that title, and then I get the next title. So for instance, for a long time, that new book of mine, Landslide, was called something terrible, like really bad, that everyone was like, yeah, well, no, not oh, that. Oh, come on, you gotta tell us. Okay, here's what it was. I sold it with this title, but everyone was like, but not the title. <laughs> Don't laugh. Now, you can laugh, but this is embarrassing, but, but, but it worked so well for me. It was, this is how much I love you and other things not to say to teenagers. <laughs> and I was like, that's it. That's brilliant. It's so colloquial. It'll be great. And they were all like, no, no. But I will tell you, it fueled me. And it got me, that's what I needed the book to be called because that's the tone I needed. That's what the mother needed to keep saying, like this is how much I love you and other things not to say, because that's the whole operation of the book. Um, so um, Landslide had to come a lot later when I realized that my character, had looked, her life had been like in a landslide. Um, so these titles come to you. This book was called something else that it's funny to me I cannot remember, but for a long time it was called something else. Now, um, Where'd You Go, Bernadette? No one ever mentioned that, maybe until the very, very end, when I was asked what I might do with the, top, with the cover, if I got to choose anything about the cover, and I, I might have said something fun, like, let's make it something fun. And, and I said, David Hockney colors are throughout this novel. Could we ever play with David Hockney colors? So I was thrilled when they sent me this. This was the first try. Wow. This was the first try, and I was like, yeah, that's it. Done. Um, I think your publisher really loves you because, first of all, I, I think that most publishers these days are like, about the business of a blurb, would you please send this to every, <laughs> every writer you've ever met, and then maybe we could come up with something, but we're not even going to spend the postage sending your damn galleys out. And then to have somebody say, like, oh, sure, I like your obscure David Hockney reference. <laughs> I think that might be Knopf. They're, they, I feel extremely lucky to be there because yeah. they care so much. I mean, so when I go down there and I visit, literally they're all like, have you seen the cover? And they're all jumping up and down and they all, I mean, it's, it's still, it's, literature's alive and well there in yeah. that building. Yeah, it's like going to never, never, no, not going there. It's like going to Disneyland. <laughs> um, yeah, but you were going to say one other thing about the Bernadette and the cover. Oh, uh, there was there was definitely a feeling, and this is something that for all you writers out there, it's very hard to know what your book's about until after. So I didn't know what my book was about. I think a lot of us in any creative project, again, we don't know what it's about until we're done. So they kept, they ask you that right at the end. They say, okay, all right, so now, you know, um, we are going to go with like three angles. What do you think? We'll go with, you know, motherhood, yoga, and alcoholism. Can you write an essay about those three things, please? And, and I thought, oh, I don't think, I didn't know it was about those things. What is it about? And so you sit with it and you think, and it slowly it comes, or it came to me, this kept coming back to me from Knopf, like everyone, all the editors, all the young editorial assistants are so excited you've written a book about motherhood and compromise. Mm -hmm. And I 
was like, oh, that's what I've written about. Okay, and I was able to go with that one. I was like, okay, we can go with that one. I was like, I will not be writing essays about alcoholism, no. And I have very little to say about yoga. <laughs> I like yoga, I am not a yogi, I like yoga a lot, but I have, I have no essays to write about yoga. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> So it's always or evolving. It's always evolving. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody out there has questions. Ooh. Or would you like to demand a reading from Susan? Because we could do that too. You want to hear the book for a minute? OK. So I'll read for just like two or three pages. And then you have to ask a few questions. If you, if you feel so moved. It's very, I know it's weird to go from us to you. But if you have a question, I'm all, I'm all ears. Okay. Um, oh, I just saw she's actually like drawn through some of the pages. Oh yeah, like I write all over this thing because there's parts I don't want to read when I'm reading. Like there's just parts that just would don't feel like they would be well read, literally. Um, so I'll just read. Like you've actually like crossed out whole pages. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, uh, I'll take us to. Um, she gets to the mountain. She gets to the mountain top. And I will tell you, for those that are interested in process, I thought this was the opening of the book. And forgive me if you've heard me speak of this, if you've come to something else, but I really thought where I'm going to read was the start of the novel. It's how I sold it, to, how my agent read it. It's how it was sitting in the world. I thought this was it. And then later I realized that I had about 15 pages of backstory that I had to handle. And I really didn't want to drop backstory in like these dead, dead weights in my urgent narrative, right? So I decided to start earlier. So I solved my backstory problem by not making it backstory. I just started earlier. So I'll read you two pages of where I thought I was starting, which is now page 18, and then I'll just read the opening paragraph and you can see what I, how I had to shift. I drove three hours into the low mountains that form a soft brown ring around the northeastern edge of the capital and parked in a grassy clearing and began climbing. Doesn't that seem like a great opening? <laughs> I was like, that's the opening of the novel. Here we go. But it's not anymore. Lucas hadn't said it was crucial I go, but I felt it was crucial and that things in my marriage were at stake I couldn't easily identify. After 30 minutes or so of walking, I came to a concrete terrace where foreigners sat drinking tea at a round plywood table. I was so happy for having made it that I looked out over the mountain valley and I imagined I could see China's coast, which becomes round south of Shanghai like a well-fed hen. The pine trees were not unlike the pine trees in Maine where I grew up, and this comforted me too. But then I got the lurching stomach I've had the two times I've ridden the rickety roller coaster in Beijing, and I thought, my God, what have you done to end up on this terrace, and how can you get home? The word terrace is too fancy, because it was more of a scrabbly concrete yard that extended over the side of the mountain, the astounding view. A retired middle school teacher named Mr. Liu and his wife, Mrs. Liu, owned the terrace and the dilapidated stone house and the rooms where we slept. Mr. Liu limped when he brought me to the table where the yoga teacher stood and said he was happy to see me and I didn't know what to say back. His western name was Justice and he had hair down to his waist that smelled of oil, the villagers pressed from apricot trees, and his skin was polished like walnuts and he was truly a beautiful man. He was also owner of the yoga station in Beijing and lead singer of a metal thrash band called We Can't Stop Kissing One Another. And Lucas and I had seen him there years ago before the children when we still went out to see music, but I didn't really know him. I looked at the faces around me and was nervous because I was going to have to talk to these people. A French man named Andre sat closest to me and seemed to use a hair oil that made his hair wavy and wet at the same time. I didn't like to be with groups of strangers. I worried that all of them at the table were probably what they called yogis, people who did a great deal of yoga. And this was a terrifying thought. Okay, so that's, that's what I thought, I, that's what I sold, that's what I sold. And now here's where I begin the book now, because I had to fit all of this in and I couldn't figure out how to do that once I had her on the mountain. You know, because backstory can slow the train down if you're not careful. So this is where I started it. 
About a year ago, my husband handed me a brochure for a retreat in a nearby mountain village. We were standing in our Beijing kitchen while the girls played make-believe dog at our feet. The brochure was more like a handmade pamphlet, four pieces of white computer paper folded in the middle and stapled three times along the crease. There was a grainy photo of a cement terrace on the cover and a more alarming photo of people sitting in a room with their eyes closed and text under the photos that explain something called a day of silence and yoga and the chance for participants to reinvent themselves. My husband, Lucas, told me these things would make a good week's vacation for me and he smiled while I looked at the photos, but it was a distant smile. He went back to his bowl of rice and I pressed myself against the edge of our stove until my lower back hurt and I felt so lonely I almost cannot say. So that's kind of that's kind of an interesting place to see if you how you responded to that. I don't know what are you, what are you thinking and, and do you see how I was able to kind of like raise the emotional stakes? Like, I got more emotion in there. She, she's lonely, she's really worried about the trip. Whereas when I started at the trip, she almost had to be just more in it, and she couldn't, like, distance and reflect on it. So that's me getting really writing nerdy on you. So, uh, any thoughts, any questions? Yes. Um, I love what you say about the process, and how the book kind of leads you, mm -hmm. and you led, and as a writer, I have a really hard time surrendering a lot of the time to what the book actually wants to say. So I'm wondering if you ever, if your brain ever tries to take over and when it does, how you get back in that place of surrender or how you, how you drop in and let it take the reins. Mm. So that for me means like living in the book, living in the book, living in the book. Thinking, being what I call highly suggestible so that everything in the universe is speaking to me about my book. Like, um, oh, it's raining out. Oh, I'm gonna have it raining on the mountain because when it rains, it's a really good like vibe for a kind of emotionality that I need to give my character. Like everything speaks to my book and that means I'm spending a lot of time in my book. And that means I'm, I'm in that high-pitched, more disciplined state I talked about. Um, so I'm not, if you are so in your book, your book will speak to you, I think, Jenny, instead of me trying to control the book. And then like, and then getting breaks, getting breaks. So working very deeply in it and then taking a step back and realizing, um, you know, I, I delivered actually yesterday. I just delivered yesterday, the, no, the new novel again. And today in the shower, I was like, Oh, oh, and I started, I'm already seeing it from afar now in a really good, healthy way so that I can next time, because it will be a next time, because now my editor will give me all my notes again and we'll do another round. Now I will see it and I will see how things that I thought I was in control of, like I will do this and this, are arbitrary now and don't make sense. Like I can already see that things that I wanted aren't going to work because the character took over. For a while I wanted her to be like someone who was desperate to leave the state of Maine. But it turns out, and you're not going to believe this, because she wrote in her Twitter or something that we were going to talk about Sabasco Lodge in Pittsburgh because that's where we met many years ago. Much of the new novel is set at Sabasco Lodge. Oh my god. <laughs> really? Seriously? For real. <laughs> I feel like, okay, so I, 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 it's, I've always thought, you know, ever since uh -oh, I read it. I think I stole that from her. No, 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 no I, I, well, actually, I'm sure I do have a chunk of something started set at Sebastian Lodge because it was that era when we were working there, it was the era when Hotel New Hampshire was a big deal. And I looked around at Sebastian Lodge and thought, well, this is, I mean, there's no mayor, but it's like such a great place. I mean, it was, it was, it was yeah. the best job I ever had. Um, Susan was a dishwasher though, so I'm thinking she's going to argue against that being the best job. She was a really glamorous waitress. <laughs> she was a waitress with polyester zip up. Yeah. You no, know, in the novel, I am a hostess. I'm I. Listen to me. I. Jill. Jill. Is it Marnie's a hostess? <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's all fiction. It's all fiction. Um, right, I think you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to uh, thank you for your sharing so honestly about your 
process. Um, and as an artist, um, growing up in the New York period in the 80s, um, all they wanted to know was what you were talking about. And I think that as more writers and artists talk about the fact that they don't know, it's just so free because in the 80s, you, that was not allowed. You couldn't even talk about that. And I think that's important for people to talk more about that. And then the, um, the process of um, being in that place of not knowing is, is very scary, but it's, it's just nice to know. But sometimes I never even know afterwards. And I've even heard artists talk about that's okay too. So I think it's just really important to talk about that because mm -hmm. at one point that was not acceptable. Mm -hmm. You really had to know pretty much mm -hmm. all the way through. And I don't know if that is true in the writing world, mm -hmm. that there was a point where people really talked about having to know what they're gonna say or what they said. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, were I writing crime fiction or a lot of other genre, I, I would have to know. And I, eventually, I get my, my frame later, much, much later. But you, I liked how you just said, it's hard. It's hard not to know. It is scary. It just is. Yeah. I think that's a little bit what you're talking about is, is in, in that era when the patriarchy really ruled fiction, even though, of course, we were all reading women, but there, it was, it was, there was a lack of equity there. And um, I think it's a little bit like men not asking for directions. Like, God forbid they say, I have no idea what my novel's about. Like, I mean, I'm pretty sure that Jonathan Franzen, by the last third of every novel he writes, has no idea what he's doing, but nobody tells him that. And I, and I think it's great. You yeah. got it. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, one last question. Okay. I'm yes. just saying, like, the sign of a good band name is that you want a t shirt or go look them up on Spotify and you nailed it, but we can't stop kissing you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. I wanna, yeah, I'd like to write more about that. I'd like more about justice. He's, a, he's one of my he's a favorite characters here. Um, all right, I will be here if you have, we didn't get to all your questions, but um, I want to thank you all very much for coming and listening and on this cold, damp day. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. <laughs>